So often, <coughs> we as the church in this time of place become captive to the, to the values and the ways of doing things that predominate, predominate in, the, in the culture that we're part of. Mm. And it's very difficult for us to actually see it. That's the great advantage of studying history. Because you can see how it's happened in the past. And if you can see how it's happened in the past, it may just alert you to the fact that there's every possibility it's happening in the present. I think it was C.S. Lewis who said something like, you know, we, we can't look into the future. And because we can't look into the future, we can't compare the now with then, but we can compare the now with the past and, and become more informed in that kind of way. So I want to, I want to talk about some, some things that have happened in, in history. Uh, and this is a story I've used a lot in, 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 with, with, with the students I've taught over the years. But you know, about just over 300 years ago, in June 1701, a group of very enthusiastic evangelical Anglican clergy in England, you're talking about the church in England, didn't quite like that so much because I'm Welsh. And, uh, <laughs> now, our relationship with the English is a little bit tense. Because we were the first lot that the English invaded and exploited. Just a little aside, my, my ancestors were Welsh miners. And um, the Welsh coal industry in its heyday, do you know what the average life expectancy of a Welsh miner was? 37 years. Because the owners of the mines couldn't give a stuff about the welfare of their workers. As long as they were ripping that black gold out, they were happy. Anyway, that's another story. This group of Anglicans, they created a mission society. It was called the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts. We'll call it SPG for short. It still exists. It's now called the United Society. And its purpose was quite simple. It said, and this was their vision statement, the care and instruction of our people settled in the colonies, and they weren't meaning Australia yet at that stage. They were basically talking about North America and the Caribbean. The conversion of Indian savages and the conversion of the Negroes. That was their, that was their aim. About nine years after they were established, they got a bequest. Now, a lot of mission societies survive on bequests. And this was a woozy. This was a great one. They, they received a slave plantation in the Caribbean, in Barbados, from a very wealthy man called Christopher Codrington. Uh, his mansion that he built in Barbados still exists. I think, I think it's a Bible, a Bible college now, yeah, from memory. So this mission society, which had a passion to see Negroes come to faith, suddenly found themselves owning 300 of them. So what do you imagine they did? Well, let me tell you. For the slaves, very little changed. SPG delegated responsibility for the day-to-day -day running of their new Barbados sugar plantations to overseers, and those overseers, in order to show the change in ownership, had all the slaves rebranded with a hot branding iron, with the word society on their chest or on their back. So the name of their new owners was there for all to see. One of the conditions of the bequest was that the number of slaves had to be kept at around 300, because that was about how many they needed to keep the sugar plantation operating economically. Sugar was like gold in the economy of Europe at that time. Now, it wasn't easy to keep your slaves at 300 because of the conditions they lived and worked under. So, uh, the SBG had to keep buying new slaves. Uh, between 1712 and 1761, they purchased another 450 slaves to replace the ones that had died. Now, they didn't die largely from old age. They died from disease, hunger, and despair. Over, over the period that they kept slaves, they ended up owning altogether about 750 of them. If you count the ones they inherited, but they got it, the number they purchased along the way. And it was only when the British Parliament passed its Abolition of Slavery Act in 1833 
that SPG gave up its slaves. And in fact, part of that bill provided compensation to slave owners, not to slaves, but to the slave owners. They got money for the slaves that they can no longer own. Now when we look back 300 years later, we think, well, how on earth could they possibly do that? To us, it's incomprehensible that they could do that kind of thing. I want us to try and understand it. Because this evangelical Christian organization was so embroiled in a system that we know is evil, how could that happen? It's estimated that between 1691 and 1779, British slave traders transported 2,141,900 slaves from largely the west coast of Africa across to the Caribbean and to the settlements in North America. And the people of the day in British industry, in commerce, in parliament, in the churches, they actually believed that this trade in black human cargo was essential to the economy. That if you stopped it, the economy would go down the toilet. And those who built the slave boats, those who owned them, those who sailed them, and the many people who grew rich on the back of the slaves were mostly card-carrying members of local churches. For example, the Anglican Bishop of Exeter, who was in partnership with three other people in owning slaves, when the 1833 bill was passed and they had to give up those slaves but got monetary compensation from the government for doing so, they received a grand total of £13,000. And that might not sound much, but if you go to Google, I encourage you to do this. Look up the Palace Hotel in Torquay. It's still functioning as a nice quality hotel today. It's a massive building. That was built by the bishop with his part of the £13,000 as his, as his kind of weekender, um, his summer palace. That's why it's called the Palace Hotel. You can go online and book a room there today um, and you can get a very nice room with breakfast in for about £150 a night. And the hotel readily acknowledges that uh, it once was the Bishop's Summer Palace. What it doesn't tell you on the website is that it was built from blood money. Now the Britain that enmeshed itself in the slave trade was the birthplace of the SPG, was this rigidly hierarchical society in which your role, your function, your future was all determined by your birth. And to that appallingly unjust structure, the church, or much of it, gave it its blessing and its theological credibility. Now, you possibly know that very famous old children's hymn, All Things Bright and Beautiful. All creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. It's a children's song, so it gets a bit sort of cutesy at this point. Each little flower that opens, each little bird that sings, he made their glowing colours, he made their tiny wings. The rich man in his castle, the poor man at his gate, God made them high or lowly and ordered their estate. <laughs> so where they were in that hierarchy was ordained by God. That's how it was supposed to be. Mm. So the church was sanctioning this, supporting it. Um, when you were talking before, John, about you know the, the, the great stuff that has come out of the Anglican Church, and there's been some wonderful stuff that has come out of the Anglican Church. But I remember once, uh, many years ago, take, going with a, a Welsh cousin um, who not travelled very much at all, and we decided we'd go and have a look at Wells Cathedral. It's a magnificent building. It's got the most incredible stained glass windows, the most amazing statuary. But on the way to Wales Cathedral, you walk through this particular part that's now kind of absorbed by shops and things. It's a stone structure made out of the same stones as the cathedral. But when the cathedral was built, and this was first built, there were no shops there. It was just the cathedral and this thing that looks like, if it was standing on its own, a very overly sort of engineered bus shelter. 
And it's called the Beggar's Gate. And it was built so that the beggars had some shelter from the elements when they begged from the worshippers as they were going into the cathedral. Now, cathedral after cathedral built in Europe to the glory of God? I don't think so. And all the cathedrals were built out of the exploitation of the poor. In fact, there are parts of at least one cathedral, I can't remember which one in the UK, that was built out of the proceeds of prostitution. It took the Wesleyan revival to shape the church out of its complacency and torpor. And it was that wonderful renewal, of course, that spawned those extraordinary 18th century reformers, the ones that we hold up as our heroes in the faith, rightfully so. Wilberforce, Shaftesbury and company. And those reformers, they were the leaders, but they had people that were with them, worked to humanise British society and to change it from one in which the poor were condemned to penury for posterity to one in which there was more opportunity for all to flourish. Now we, we know, because we've all seen the movie Amazing Grace, that Wilberforce was a key leader in the slave trade. And one of those that helped make that institution illegal. When the campaign to end slavery began, as you will have seen if you watched the movie or, or read the books, very few took it seriously. But the men and women who led that campaign did so with a passion and a determination that was fueled by their faith. Mm. And by their own experience of the love of God and their conviction about the justice of God. And they inspire us. In them we see a love for humanity and a love for God that led to a challenging of those values and practices in their society which were clearly out of alignment with the character and values of God. But we need to remember that for a long time theirs were just voices crying in the wilderness. And the great majority of those who sat next to them in the pews on a Sunday morning didn't share those convictions. Every generation of Christians since the church began is placed under huge pressure to conform to the surrounding society's dominant ways of thinking mm. and living. Mm. And those ways are nearly always contrary to God's ways. And every church, every generation of the church since Jesus launched it, has encountered that pressure and usually succumbed. Remember what Paul wrote to the Christians in Rome? Let me read it to you. He's, and this is from the, uh, the Phillips paraphrase. I still quite like that. He says, With eyes wide open to the mercies of God, I beg you, my brothers and sisters, as an act of intelligent worship, to give him your bodies as a living sacrifice, consecrated to him, and acceptable by him. And then note these words. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mould. But let God remould your minds from within so that you may prove and practice that the plan of God for you is good, meets all his demands and moves toward the goal of true maturity. Now I don't know if the people in the expositor's pulpit that, uh, that John was talking about actually talked about the kind of communities that Paul was actually writing to. And the fact that these tiny Christian communities were embedded in the belly of the beast, the Roman Empire. And, and, and the things that they believed and that they taught and they adhered to were, were in, in violation of so much that was considered to be sacred within the Roman Empire. And Paul was just is pleased to these Christians to live differently were just urgent. He begged them to live differently because he said, he knew, and he said, if you don't do that, then you actually don't have a gospel to preach. Mm. We are called to be embedded in the world, but we're called to be different from it at every point where faithfulness to Jesus requires us to walk a different path. Someone else we were looking at in, in, in class, one day I was showing a little bit of, from YouTube, is Dr. Bay, um, I'm not sure how you pronounce his name, Bay is an ordeal. And he was a, a, a leading South African theologian in the Dutch Reformed Church in South Africa. 
And it was the Dutch Reformed Church in South Africa which gave theological sanction and blessing to apartheid. And Nordea, after witnessing or hearing about the Sharpeville Massacre in 1963, had a complete change of heart and mind. He resigned his membership of the Bruderbond, which was this semi-secret society, of sort of basically a fascist society within South Africa. And he preached in his church what he knew would be his last sermon in that church, because in this sermon, he preached against the evils of apartheid. And in this, in this interview, he talks about the fact that he and his wife then went to the entrance of the church to see people as they filed out, like you normally do, and they usually go past and say, lovely sermon vicar, or something, your name like that. Most of them wouldn't even look him in the eye. And other people expressed their anger, and other people were visibly upset. And talking years and years later about this, as he talked about the price they had to pay as a couple, and how they were ejected from the community that they'd grown up in, all their friendships, their kinship groups, his, his eyes welled up with tears. It was a great price to pay. But the other side of that coin was that he became a close, confident and friend Desmond Tutu and those who were working for a different South Africa. Many years later, after he'd been released from incarceration, Mandela described Nordea and his wife as the true South Africans whose lives demonstrated what it means to rise above race. I don't know if you caught the fact that recently, with the second inauguration of Obama, it took place on Martin Luther King Day in the US. I want to read to you some extracts from an amazing letter that Martin Luther King wrote when he was incarcerated in jail in Birmingham, one of the most racial cities in the US, in April 1963. And he was responding to uh, the public criticism that had been made of him by a group of white clergy in that city. They criticised the street protests that he had been leading as he, as, they try, as he tried to draw attention to the evils of racial discrimination. This letter was written in the margins of a newspaper because it was the only paper he had access to in the prison cell. It's a long letter. I'm just going to read a few extracts, so bear with me. I wish I could um, read it the way he would say it. Perhaps it's easy for those who have never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say, wait. But when you've seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you've seen hate-failed policemen curse, kick and even kill your black brothers and sisters when you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that has just been advertised on television and see tears welling up in her eyes when she is told that fun town is closed to coloured children, and see ominous clouds of inferiority beginning to form in her little mental sky, mm -hmm. and see her beginning to distort her personality by developing an unconscious bitterness toward white people. When you have to concoct an answer for a five-year-old son who is asking, Daddy, why do white people treat coloured people so mean? When you take a cross-country drive and find it necessary to sleep night after night in the uncomfortable corners of your automobile because no motel will accept you. When you are humiliated day in and day out by nagging signs reading white and coloured. When your first name becomes nigger and your middle name becomes boy, however old you are. And your last name becomes John and your wife and mother are never given the respected title missus. So he goes on writing in that vein. And he says, There comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over and men are no longer willing to be plunged into the abyss of despair. I hope, sirs, you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatience. And then he writes these words. Let me make note of another major disappointment. I've been so greatly disappointed with the white church 
and its leadership. Of course, there are some notable exceptions. But despite these notable exceptions, I must honestly reiterate that I've been disappointed with the church. I say this as a minister of the gospel who loves the church, who was nurtured in its bosom, who has been sustained by its spiritual blessings, and will remain true to it as the cord of life shall lengthen. But in the midst of blatant injustices inflicted upon the Negro, I've watched white churchmen stand on the sideline and mouth pious irrelevancies and sanctimonious trivialities. In sweltering summer days and crisp autumn mornings, I've looked at the South's beautiful churches with their lofty spires pointing heavenward. I've beheld the impressive outlines of her massive religious education buildings. Over and over, I've found myself asking, what kind of people worship here? Who is their God? Where were their voices of support when bruised and weary Negro men and women decided to rise from the dark dungeons of complacency to the bright hills of creative protest? Yet, yes, these questions are still in my mind. In deep disappointment, I've wept over the laxity of the church. But be assured that my tears have been tears of love. There can be no deep disappointment where there is not deep love. Yes, I love the church. The election of an African American to the presidency is powerful testament to the huge changes in US society for which Martin Luther King and others sacrificed their lives. Yet Sunday mornings, we are told, are still the most segregated time of the week in the USA. I beg you, wrote Paul, do not allow the world around you to squeeze you into its, its mind. So what about us? What about this generation of God's people? Located in this time, in this place, in what ways is the world squeezing us to conform to ways of thinking and ways of acting that are out of alignment with the will of God? Because we can be absolutely certain that's what the world is doing. Squeezing us. Mm. We've been looking back at things of 300 years ago and of 50 to 60 years ago. But what if a group of committed followers of Jesus in the future, maybe 50 years from now or 100 years, were to look back at us? Will they be disappointed by what we have done or said or would they be encouraged? Maybe even a little bit inspired. For example, will those who look back upon us see followers of Jesus who demonstrated the power of the gospel over mammon and materialism? Or will they see a people who succumbed to the deceit of those alternative gods in the same way that the society around us has? Will they see people who are fearful of those who are strange to us because of their colour or religion or language? Or will they see people whose own experience of the love of Christ compels them to love their neighbours just as God loves them? In the age, the week before last, I came across this letter by Dr. David Zingler of Monash University. I don't know him. But he writes, It is no surprise that the call for public schools to seek philanthropic support comes when the state has cut two billion from our school system. Public schools must be adequately funded by public money. Department Secretary Richard Bolt claims there is an ambiguous relationship between education results and funding. But in Australia, the percentage of government spending on public education continues to fall while funding for private schools it rises. This is unique in the OECD countries. Education in Victoria is a scene of grave injustice and inequity. And I learned when I came to live in Melbourne for the first time uh, back in early 1984 that if I wanted to start a fight in church, all I had to do was start talking about private school. <laughs> education. I remember a conversation with my son 
who at that stage was about probably about 13. The youth group that he was part of at St Hilary's had gone off to a, a very well-endowed private school for a, for a night in the swimming pool and in the gym and so on. And he went to a little government school just down the road from where, where we were living. The school he went to was Kunang Secondary College. And he was so angry when he got home. And he was angry because of what he saw that school had and compared it to what his school didn't have. Mm. There are schools that have incredible resources, fine buildings, rural campuses, sports and performing arts complexes that are unbelievable. And at the other extreme of the resource for public schools in the economically poorer parts of town. Do we care about these inequalities? Do we care enough to challenge our politicians to commit to doing all that they can to ensure that every Aussie kid has equal educational opportunity? Well, that's at the very foundation of a just and fair society. I remember visiting a school in the northern parts of Ethiopia. And this school being set up by a, an indigenous Christian organization. And uh, in every province, of Ethiopia there's an education department and they run exams for every kid in every school and they start those exams when they're like in grade one and they keep doing their annual exams till they get until they graduate from school and they're common exams this school had topped the province for three years in a row and the only qualification a child needed to get into that school was that their family was destitute. All the children in that school had no more, at most they had one parent, and many of them had no parents. And the school had been performing so well that the problem it was encountering was of rich people dressing down to try and get their kids into the school. <laughs> and what it showed was you can take kids from the very bottom of the socioeconomic heap and give them an opportunity for a decent education and they can achieve at the same rate as the kids from the top of the economic camp. And I can tell you, one of the things that I used to like doing when I was in pulpits and Presbyterian and Anglican churches in particular, was asking them if they had ever put money into a school in Australia for the destitute. Most of our politicians are too scared to go anywhere near this issue. As a result, the reforms recommended by the Gonski report more than 12 months ago are still just sitting there gathering dust. And educational inequality increases as each year goes back. Well, what are the implications of that? Well, in 50 years' time, will Victoria be a place of entrenched social and economic inequalities and injustices? A place of gated communities? which the affluent hide behind security fences and guards while urging their politicians to build yet more prisons? It will be, if we keep going in the direction we go. Or will it be a society in which anything less than a commitment to social justice and the fair treatment of all from cradle to grave will be deemed as un-Australian behaviour? It's a ridiculous term, I know, but anyway, that's what the politicians use, so I'll use it. And what part will we have played in generating either of those outcomes? And will our future sisters and brothers in Christ be encouraged or disappointed by what we've done? Let's take another issue, climate change. It's a good day to be talking about it. The world is heating up faster than the climate change scientists were predicting even a few years ago. And the impact has already been felt in many of the world's most vulnerable communities. Malaria, one of the deadliest killers of the poor, is travelling into higher altitudes into communities that have no immunity to malaria. The monsoon, once as reliable as Big Ben, becomes unreliable as the, the legs or back of an Australian fast bowler. 
And that unreliability means that poor people in places like Nepal or Bangladesh are finding it increasingly difficult to grow adequate food to feed themselves and their families. As predicted, there's been a substantial increase in the frequency and intensity of what we call major weather events. Houses and livelihoods are being destroyed even in rich communities like in the US and Australia. But the numbers of people suffering from such events is far, far greater in sub-Saharan Africa. And the poor, who have done literally nothing to contribute to climate change, mm. will suffer the most because of it. It's a massive case of global injustice. There's much that can be done, much needs to be done. We're too late to stop temperature rise, to stop it getting to an increase of two degrees. That, that target is gone. But we have to work to stop it going from to three to four to five degrees, which would be simply catastrophic. And the only way we can do that is by changing the way we live. And we live in a state that is one of the worst offenders in the world, with our dirty coal and the electricity we use, and with few exceptions, our churches are absolutely silent. That's right. Mm. A group of my master's students, um, who one of the units we study in our master's program is called Climate Change and Justice, and these these are Aussie students, and they're in different parts of the country, some in the city, some in rural areas. And when they started talking to one another over Skype, they found a number of them had a very similar experience. And that's when people in the church said, well, what are you studying this semester? They said, climate change. They said, people started shouting at us. They shouted at us. Because it's become such a politicised issue in this country. Unlike, say, someone like the UK. And so for their, their, what we call their social inquiry project, a group of them decided they would, they would run a survey as wide as they could to find out what is it that informs the views of the people sitting in our churches about climate change. And they sent out a survey, and I think they had something like 450, 500 responses uh, around the country. And the most alarming thing that they found was this. It didn't matter whether you were a dreadlocked climate change sort of um, activist at the one end of the spectrum or a climate change denialist at the other. If you were sitting in the church, the church had had no influence on your views because it was not a subject that was ever mentioned, never preached on, never discussed. Here we are facing what I'm sure is the most significant global injustice in the world today in the Australian church with a few wonderful exceptions, is silent. Well, I've just mentioned a couple of areas where the world is trying to squeeze us into its mould and live differently from where our faith and our Lord would ask us mm. to be living. And there are a whole bunch of other areas that we could discuss but I need to finish and then I think there's an opportunity for some sort of questions. questions.